Hello, all my beautiful Sun Rare Moths, or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle, a podcast about publishing and all things books. And today I'm going to be talking about handling feedback from your editor. And there are four major types of feedback that we give our authors. One is developmental feedback, one is content feedback, the other is line feedback, and then proofreading feedback. And all of those contain way more information and way more critiquing of the writing than most authors are prepared for. And I think that when you live with the, that the longer that it takes to get your book published, the longer you've lived with that version of your book, the harder it can be to take different types of edits. And I find that the developmental edits down to the proofreading edits are All of them are equally hard for authors. And so I want to give you an inside look just from the perspective of the the person who's doing some of the edits and giving some of the feedback and the perspective from a press why we have some of those edits done and what our thinking is. So you can kind of see that the energy that it's being done with and the spirit that it's being done with and the actual care that's going into it. And if you're not feeling like there's a lot of care and respect for your art and your work going into it, then I think you might be at the wrong press or with the wrong editor. And that's something that you really need to take into consideration. The last episode when I was talking about pitching books, I was talking about how I fall in love with with all of my authors. And I think having that personal relationship with the authors, and, you know, I'm not talking romantic love, and I don't want to run off into the sunset with sunset with them, but I am saying that I really care about them deeply, and I really care about their success deeply, and all of my authors trust that I want them to succeed, and all of my authors trust that I want them to have the best version of their book out in the world, and because we have that trust, even if some of the feedback is hard, they're able to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to need a few days with this. This round of, of editing was really hard on me. Give me a minute because I need to adjust. And there are some books that the book that I bought resembles nothing like the book that I published. And I think that in those cases, when there's that kind of developmental edit, where it's a lengthy process, I think our longest developmental edit process has been three years with one author. And I'm humbled and honored that they trusted me enough that I was seriously wanting to publish their book. And I was just really wanting it to have the best representation of their intentions and also to tell a consistent story. And we had a lot of conversation back and forth. So when it comes to developmental edit, what I'm looking at is, does this story make sense? Does the rules of this world make sense? Is the character development consistent? Does the character development fit the genre and the age group? And am I lost or confused anywhere along the story does this drag what can we do to have it you know good pacing it's just all of like the structures of storytelling is the developmental edit and the developmental edit is not because i don't trust the author to tell their story i do trust them or i wouldn't have signed them to a deal right and so it can be very confusing for authors when they get signed to a deal and then they have to go through a developmental process And what that means is that I don't think that the book is where it needs to be for publication, but I do think that the author can get it there because I'm not rewriting the book, I'm making suggestions and then the author is rewriting it. And that can be really, really hard. And I think before expressing anger or frustration, instead ask for space. And that's something that I tell all of my authors, take some time, process what's being said, and think about, is it true to your artistic vision? And if it's not true to your artistic vision, 
then we're at an impasse and you have to decide is making the changes so egregious that you would rather not have your book published or making the changes so egregious that you would always feel negative about the book in the form that it's going to be published, then you should try and get out of that deal. And if no money has changed hands, it's usually pretty easy to get out of a deal. If money has changed hands, then you're going to have to give the money back. And that's just the way the cookie crumbles on that. Nobody's going to want you let you keep the money and not publish your books. They're going to want to get the advance back for the book that they are not getting. And there have been cases with us where during the developmental phase, authors have said, no, thank you. And that's just not the story I want to tell. Even if it is the story that they pitched us, we've had that a couple of times where they're like, where are you getting the idea that this is what the book is going to be about? And I send them back their exact query letter and I say, this line in the query letter said this and these are the original chapters you sent me. And sometimes that just what happens is that the author, while they're waiting or while you're in the querying process, you decide to take the book a completely different direction. You have to remember what you queried and what you represented because that is that is what the agent or press are signing on for, right? Is, is what happened in that initial query and what did those first three chapters say? If you completely rewrite the beginning of your book and take it in a completely different direction developmentally and you just can't get on the same page, it may be that you do have to kibosh the deal and go somewhere else. But I say do it respectfully and kindly. For us, any deal that developmentally the author didn't agree with us, we still support their book and we still support the authors and cheer them on and interact with them on social media and, and all of those kinds of things. And it's still really friendly. And I'm really proud of that because I, I do want them to succeed. And I hope that they find a home that agrees with their artistic vision and the, the developmental phase. And this sometimes happens in sequels. If the book, so specifically for developmental edits on sequels, I reread the first book before I read the second book when I'm doing a developmental edit on book two. And if it's not making sense for book for me to put down book one and pick up book two, it's not going to make sense for someone else. And I advise authors to read the last three chapters of your book and see where you left off the story and make sure that if there's going to be a big time jump, how are you helping people get into it? And then you have to do the extra thing in a sequel and you have to make sure it's also a standalone and how do you do that while keeping up a good pace? And this is usually where with sequels, the developmental edit can be a little process can be a little bit bumpy for authors and that okay wait this is too much oh this is not enough and just getting that you know sort of the goldilocks of it getting it getting it just right and that part can be a little bit tedious and frustrating but usually after that with sequels everything goes really really smooth so that's a developmental edit the other kind of edit that we do is called a comp a uh, content edit and it is a full manuscript edit. The developmental edit, I usually do those three chapters at a time if I know that we're going into a major rewrite of a manuscript. Um, and so I find it's easier to do it three chapters at a time so that way it's not an overwhelming amount of feedback for the author and it's not also not an overwhelming amount of adjustments for me because there's usually a, a place in the developmental phase where like, okay, you've got it from here. I trust you. Go for it. Um, content edits for me, when I'm doing a content edit, I do content edits because I do read every single word of every single book we publish and the content edit comes in if the content is just inappropriate. And I find that a lot of authors struggle with their age group and having appropriate content for their age group and making sure that it reads for the entire span of the age group. So I'm always looking at lower limits of age groups. 
and looking at the beta readers. So content edits usually happen either when I read it and feel something's inappropriate or I get overwhelming feedback from our beta readers that it just doesn't feel like the right age group or it feels inappropriate or it's off-putting in some way. The, like if I get a lot of feedback from beta readers that it's going to be, they did not finish the book. When a beta reader does not finish the book, I that usually kicks it back to a developmental edit, but sometimes it's just a matter of the content edits. And we curate our beta readers. So grit lit is not for everybody. Transgressive literature is not for everybody. Middle grade is not for everybody. And we have beta readers in every age category and also separated by the types of things that they like to read. Just like you would curate a PR list, you curate your beta reader list to make sure you're not sending somebody who loves safe middle grade transgressive fiction. Usually we do have some that read across that will read anything, but we have some that's like, no, I would never send them something transgressive. And also with the content edit, it'll come into play if a character has a disability. We do have uh, beta readers that do sensitivity reads to make sure that the actions of the person that has a disability is consistent with that disability. And that requires reading every single line of the book to make sure that that character is consistent throughout. And sometimes we'll give content notes for that. So content notes is really about, does the book fit? Is it appropriate? And is it staying consistent all the way through? And those edits can be really, really hard. And sometimes it can get stuck on a phrase or a word. I have had the experience where I changed a particular phrase and I was just like, mm, this phrase has to change. It has to be this instead of that. And the author just said, hey, what about this? Hey, what about this? Hey, what about this? And that was completely appropriate. They're fighting for their image of that phrase. And I'm sadly saying no, 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 but I'm not being frustrated. I'm sure they're being challenged and I'm sure that they're being frustrated. I'm not, I'm expecting it. That's why I alerted them to the change because I think it's going to be one that will be hard for them to see. And I don't want them to see that change in the line edit. And I don't want, for me, I'm very protective of our editors and I don't like to have any sort of conflict between our editors and our authors. And I don't want them to blame people that aren't me for things. And that's because we're a small press. And I just want to make sure that there's good relationships between everybody who's working together. And I think because I'm the owner that it's easier for people to say, hey, this is my vision. And this is part of my curation of the books that we publish and I can explain to them my vision and why I have the feelings that I have in a way that I feel like an editor doesn't have the ability to do because my editors they can't change the vision of a book and that's something that is challenging sometimes for the editor when I'm like hey there's this thing in the book you're gonna hate that I love please keep it in and sometimes it's a regional dialect and there are things specific to regional dialects that I do ask the editors to keep in and that's really challenging for them. And the Provost series has a specific dialect and so they have a, um, a phrase Ewan's and that is specific to the region in the United States that it comes from and so it's really important to leave it in but it's grammatically completely incorrect for international grammar and there are some international readers that they're like there's some of this like culturally I was just like what but I enjoyed the story and that's acceptable to me because I want to keep it true to what's going on and the same when we're doing uh, bilingual editing where the person who is speaking Spanish doesn't have perfect Spanish and so the Spanish is imperfect because the person speaking it is not truly bilingual and that can be really challenging. So some of the Spanish in, in Icarus over Collins is 
a little bit different. And that's because we have several Spanish speakers from several different countries. And just like English, Spanish doesn't have just one way that it's spoken in every country and neither does English. So those types of things are challenging for editors and that's feedback I'm giving the editors. And I think that that builds a bond between me and the author. And I think that's a way that you can talk with your editor and say, hey, you're going to come across this thing. Let me highlight it for you and tell you why it's there and why it's important. And finding an editor that's willing to do that and finding a press that understands that and an agent that understands that, if that's something specific to your book, if you have something that's regional or you have something that's bilingual, making sure that they understand what's going on and why those things exist will really reduce the friction in, in the editing process and help you feel more confident that they get your vision and that their editing is going to support that. With the line edit, we're really looking at does the grammar of every single sentence make sense? And I have so much compassion for our authors that have to go through the line edit process because it is so painful to get your manuscript back and we track changes to see all of those red lines and thousands and thousands of corrections. And the biggest correction that we have to do in line edits is shifting tenses that are not appropriate or shifting points of view that are not appropriate. If you're shifting from first to third person and it's kind of wonky, we have to then decide, hey, we're going to switch it to all first person or hey, we're going to switch it to all third. And the same thing with the tense. Sometimes authors like to tell stories in a way that's a memory, but the reader won't know that it's a memory until the end and they pop in and out of the memory state. That's really confusing for a reader and usually doesn't go over well. And we are thinking about the review process for authors. And when you put a book up on Book Sirens, I find Book Sirens and we also use NetGalley, those reviews tend to be um, a little bit on the brutal side sometimes when it comes to grammar. We also do library things and they tend to be fairly gentle, but every now and then. And I kind of feel like sometimes editors will read books and use their review to audition for us as a press or to audition for authors to hide, to hire their, their proofreading or editing services. And I just, mm, if you're an editor and you're doing that, please stop. It doesn't work. It turns me off and shuts me down. Um, I would rather a direct message to me saying, hey, I've noticed this thing in all of your books. Um, and it would have to be something you're noticing in every single one of our books. A really rough uh, review of the editing of, of one book. For me, it depends on regionally and what it is you're seeing as the mistake. And sometimes the mistakes people are highlighting are not internationally correct, they're regionally correct. So we edit our books always to the standard of international grammar. And international grammar has different rules. We try to use American spelling. Sometimes we do have a couple of UK spellings that will slip in and I own that, that we don't catch all of it. Um, we're an American company, but I'm based in Japan and a lot of our authors are from the UK and Europe. And so we do get a mix and a blend and I'll own that we're not perfect on the line edit. But the line edit is really, really tough um, on authors because it is thousands and thousands of changes that they have to go through. And not every company does this, but our policy is for our authors, we start the process so early on that we're able to send them a copy of track changes for their book and any track changes that they don't agree with, they're able to put a mark by it, any changes, additional changes that they think need to be made, because sometimes 
and reading it, they can be like, oh, hey, I noticed an extra period here or, or an extra space here. And they're able to make those changes provided that they track all of the changes that they make. And then we send that off to be typeset once that process is done for the line edit. The final type of editing that we do is proofreading. And editors love when it's just a proofreading gig. We have some authors that just have an amazing grasp of, of grammar and it their grammar is so tight that we always know quick edit and we highlight them on the, on the editing calendar. Um, their books are actually in a different color and it does you know, the space around their books, uh, they're usually a, a one or two day edit for, for the editor. And we absolutely love that. And that's proofreading. Um, proofreading is not looking at every line. It's looking at the, the bigger space, looking at things at paragraphs and, and the page level. Um, some of our authors it is just a scanning of the page level and just giving that, that added support. Um, Watching our editors edit is just a mystery to me. The way that they move through the page is different. So I'm dyslexic and I'm not an editor, so I can't really explain the tracking that goes on. But they're not reading every single word is the point at the proofreading. And there's still hundreds and sometimes thousands of changes that come back from a proofread. Um, usually it's more in the hundreds than in, in the thousands. And at that stage, what it is, is it's just grammar. It's just gr grammatical rules. The same with, with the line edit. It's just grammar. And it is changing it from your regional grammar to international grammar. When you get those back, getting angry that somebody is correcting your grammar or disagreeing with them, I think there is a way to approach that if you have the right level of humility going in to the editing process. And it does, I've had my stuff professionally edited. I have a PhD and I had um, my thesis professionally edited and all every paper I ever turned in in college has been professionally edited. And it is humbling. And I just go in with like, hey, hit me with it. Hit it. Let me know. And I found that being open to it and looking at the changes, I was able to improve as a writer. Um, and I still only write in the nonfiction space. I have a couple of short stories out, but I'm not really a fiction writer. And for me, I just look at it as I want to be the best nonfiction writer that I can be. I want to catch my systemic mistakes. I want to see, like, what am I doing over and over again that I can stop what is a writing habit that is creating a barrier of entry for people that I, I want to read it. What's going to be distracting to the reader? What's going to catch their eye and take them out of the story? If you're going in with a collaborative attitude and a collaborative understanding and above everything else, trust that this editor has a better grasp on grammar than you do, that they are an a grammar expert, that's going to help you kind of cool the emotional space and be like, okay, I sent this to an expert. I wanted them to look at it so that I could look professional and like an expert. And I trust that they want the best version of my book in the world. And there are times that we have had typesetting errors that authors have alerted us to. There have been times that we have had editing errors that our authors have alerted us to. And because we have this collaborative process, I look at, hey, you're going to care. The author is going to care and really pay attention and give us another set of eyes looking at this, this work so that we're putting the best version out in the world for the best possible chance to get the best reviews, to win awards, to, you know, be purchased at bookstores, to be showcased at book fairs, to get our, our authors invitations to read their book and host events and and really become a, a professional author where they're making a living off their writing. And that's the energy that we're coming with. And if you don't believe that your team is coming with that energy for you, 
it's time to get a different team so that you can trust them. Because it does, handling feedback is about believing that that feedback is coming from a place of positive intention and coming from a place of your best interest at heart. And if you don't believe that a press or an agent or an editor has your best interest at heart, then it's going to make it really hard to trust and maybe that's not the right team for you. So having that personal relationship and me getting on the mic and and saying this for any authors out there who end up working with us, you can kind of know what to expect. And for all of our authors, just thank you so much for choosing us to be your press. I love every single book that we publish and I love every single author that we work with. And I'm just so humbled and honored that they are all just so awesome at handling the feedback process. It's just amazing to me. They should be just like the writing world's role models to me. And I'm, I feel very, very lucky that I'm, I'm not having any contentious or challenging experiences. I am having a lot of really great conversations and a lot of food for thought and sometimes debate, but it's always respectful. And if you're not able to have conversations and debate, and if they're not able to respectfully listen to your point of view and, you know, be like, hey, last time, but I just got to ask one more time, can we go with this instead of this? If, you know, if you're not able to do that, I'm sorry. And you need to, to have a better team. And at the end of the day, what are you willing to do for your book to be published? I guess is the thing you have to ask yourself if you have a contract, because once you sign that, that contract legally, most contracts, the publishing house has the final say. And that's something to to take into consideration about the editing process. And I think maybe a question to ask before you sign, like what would the process be for your book? Um, I just tell authors before they sign what I think. And I'd be like, hey, your book's great. Um, It'll be edited. It's going to be proofread. It needs a line edit. I usually say what level of editing that the book is going to get before the author signs so they can have an understanding of what the process will look like for them. So, yeah. That's dealing with feedback from your editor. And I guess more than dealing with feedback, I kind of spoke up for the editor's point of view and my point of view. Um, And also some red flags for you and, and things for you to think about. And I hope that your publishing process is going awesome and that you're feeling good about it. Because, you know, like I always say, this podcast is a, is a love letter to authors. So I just really do love authors. I think y'all are doing amazing work. I love reading. And I'm so appreciative of the amount of art that there is in the world. And I thank all of our beautiful Cinnabar Moths for listening. You don't have to be a Cinnabar Moth. You can be any kind of moth you want to be. Or you can even be a butterfly. But I'm not Mariah Carey and I'm not trying to bite her rhyme. Bye. <laughs>